the real design, if I have to define, is something that begins when the landscape, the space for all the logical thoughts and, and thinking ends and begin the space for the magic. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy Devers, and this is Clever. It's our 200th episode, and we are celebrating with a very special guest. Today, I'm talking to the phenomenal Patricia Urquiola. Patricia is a true powerhouse of design and is widely considered to be one of the most lauded, in-demand, and influential designers of our time. Her prolific and profound contributions span architecture, interiors, product, furniture, textiles, fashion, art direction, and strategy consulting. She's made an indelible mark on the design of the built world through her now iconic works that offer a unique point of view with an approachable warmth and vibrant presence. She works with important international design companies, including Alessi, B&B Italia, Capellini, Ferragamo, Hayworth, Cartel, Quadrat, Louis Vuitton, Moroso, and Rosenthal. Recent architecture projects include Il Serena Hotel in Como, the roommate Giulia Hotel in Milan, the SD96 Yacht for San Lorenzo, Dash Du Hotel in Berlin, showrooms and installations for BMW, Casina, Missoni, and more. And since 2015, she's been the creative director of Casina. There are just too many accolades to list here. She's won several prestigious international prizes and awards. Her work is exhibited in museums the world over, and she has many times been named Designer of the Year or even Designer of the Decade by prominent international design publications. Her studio, Studio Urquiola, founded in 2001 with her partner Alberto Zontone, is now a team of around 70. With 18 nationalities represented and 15 foreign languages spoken, it's a very international community, with designers and architects collaborating in the most interrelated possible way. Studio Orchiola is frequently asked not just to design objects and architecture, but also to think about the future of mobility, workplace, and production cycles. She also leads the company she works with to change, evolve, and innovate by reimagining entire processes, creating links between heritage craftsmanship and innovative technologies, and upcycling waste material. Her design point of view merges humanistic, technological, and social approaches, and she describes her design thinking as being at the intersection of challenges and breaking prejudices and finding unexpected connections between the familiar and the unexplored. She's led an extraordinary life, and it plays out like a who's who of creative masterminds. She's worked with or been mentored by some very significant figures in design history, including Achille Castiglione, Vico Magistretti, and Maddalena de Pavita. And with boundless energy and insatiable curiosity, you'll hear her talk about her fascination with varied interests, such as modern philosophy, AI, and Judy Chicago's The Dinner Party. For this one, you may want to follow along on the transcript. We've taken great care to hyperlink all of the significant design figures, movements, art, books, brands, and philosophers she mentions so that you can go down all of the rabbit holes you want. You can find that at cleverpodcast.com. Patricia's journey is nothing short of remarkable, and she brings us right along with her on a trip that feels like part intellectual obstacle course and part magic carpet ride. Here's Patricia. I am uh, Patricia Urquiola. I'm an um, architect and designer. I'm uh, 100% Spanish, but I think 100% Milanese too, where, because it's the city where I live and work. We have a studio of um, architecture and design. I'd love to back up to your origin story and kind of understand how you got to be who you are now. Can you tell me the story of your childhood? You're from Oviedo, Spain, yes? Allora, sì, sì, I come from the north of Spain, you know, but you know, Spain, as I live in Italy, they always think that they have a kind of Mediterranean 
origin, no? Mm. But I am from the north of Spain, and the north of Spain is the Atlantic side, and it's facing to the ocean. It's, it's a kind of different powerful idea, no, of growth. For example, you saw, um, I'm, I'm the second daughter of three children, then I am the, the always in between. Mm-hmm. And the always in between is always... Middle child. <laughs> yes, you know, I don't know, see, you know, always in between. You never know. Uh, they, they forget you many times. Like, I think, <laughs> yeah. uh, see, you've got a portion of, of freedom always more than your brother. So I have a big sister, but they were always focusing just to understand what to do or not to do. And I had a younger brother that was the male, all right? You know, who was so nice, <laughs> so gentle. Uh, then I was in the middle, no? It was very, very, that's always interesting. My father was an engineer. Mm-hmm. And my mother was, did something, I think, nice. She created a family very young. And uh, when we born, the three of us, just she come back to study and she studied English philology and philosophy in the 70s. Then she was going to the university or, or doing a lot of homeworks in her desk, in her room. Mm. I remember a lesson, uh, you know, suffering, you know, and that kind of a student uh, attitude. Uh, I think it was nice to see her when we were about 10 years old. And then I think it was something she, she shared with us in a way that normally you don't share with your mother. So you saw her being driven and curious. See, and, see. Yeah. And suffering, you know, the exam that never ended or <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. things like this, no. Rigorous and rugged. See, and it was the end of the period of Franco, no? Then um, we were always moving to the south of France because the culture was coming from there. It was our salvation. Okay. As my father was a Basque. Okay. Obviously, always Atlantic and North Ocean side, but they were just in the in the frontier, no? With Pay Basque, with, with I like it a lot that the the grandparents, the the Basque ones, they were coming always to visit. But I remember the grandmother; she was always doing for us Basque jackets with pompon, and I was always breaking them. Then it was a um, my sister was always perfect, and me, I was um, so you were putting me something, and something was breaking. Uh, my mother <laughs> always said at the beginning I couldn't understand you choose that profession because you were always breaking everything at home. I couldn't you no. Know. Why were you breaking things? Were you were you rougher on them? Were you playing harder? Who knows? Okay. Who knows? <laughs> I think uh, I've got the, the lucky thing that I had a brother, then I could always work and play with uh, things, not only girls and Barbie things. I could be, play with a garage or with many other things that he had. Then we were always sharing no? uh, different ways of working and possibly I was curious. And then you dismantle everything, no? That is a very good... <laughs> yes, yes. Taking things apart. That makes perfect sense. <laughs> yes. And this never get bright anymore, you know? That is surely... You still got it. <laughs> See, and then I, I grew up in this part of Spain. Where it's a culture quite interesting because it's uh, it's about rain, about the seaside. Is you know, the beach. For us, was always a beach. That it was in a space with the same name, but it was always relative to time because sometimes you could walk and go to the beach because it was not raining. Mm-hmm. But secondary thing, because it was big and was large, then you could walk. The tide was uh, the right tide. But in other moments when there was no beach, then th- th- this idea of a beach, I, I think gave me the idea of temporality a lot in my education. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. Those things, they are, you keep them with you, no, for a long time. Or for example, you know, my, my grandfather had a, a house just nearby that beach. We were always going in Salinas. In summertime, a lot of surfers were coming always to that beach. And in front of the house, uh, there was a um, there was a big window, the biggest in the house. Uh, mm. And then there was a little chair in wood with three legs, uh, micro chair. Then good for me because I was really picolina, really little. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I even ate sometimes the flies coming to the grass. Then there was, no, this girl has problems because uh, <laughs> I was three years, I think was quite little, but I was there sharing the view, and then tuck, sometimes I was eating a fly. They were saying, why she eats flies? Wait, 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 wait. You were eating flies. I okay. don't know. Yes, they always <laughs> said that to me, that when I was little, there was, I, did, I found some problems that were already, yeah, very present. <laughs> <laughs> you were hungry for life. <laughs> I don't know, poor little flies. I can't <laughs>
But, I mean, that sort of makes sense to me, the temporality and then the theater of the ocean in front of that framed window and you sitting there on the little three-legged chair eating flies. What a picture you just painted. I see, see, (laughs) but I I, I remember that perfectly. Uh, You know, uh, my mother was one of the younger sisters. She had two elder sisters, and then there were always cousins, that, but they were cousins, but they were always 15 years elder than me. Mm. They were always coming from London when I was young. Oh. Then I was completely absorbed by by the things that were coming in summer to that house from my cousins. So that was fantastic. Yes. So aunts and cousins coming from London, bringing a sort of cosmopolitan cultural influence. Uh, something different. Something different. Yeah, something yes. different. Yes, yes, something different. Yes, always. And older women have a certain mystique to a young, <laughs> to a a young lot of girl. Women, a lot of women with opinions in my house. Yes. A lot of crossover of that. Thing. A fantastic man, blah, blah, blah. But uh, <laughs> I think uh, girls were, were very alive. For example, another decision that my parents had when I was adolescent. Okay. In that period, uh, my mother, when more or less Franco died, and uh, uh, it was quite the end of the 70s, and uh, my mother wanted my father to go to Ibiza to have a place there, because they were saying, Spain is not enough. We need a place that is changing our life, because really they, they needed a place to, to trust other things. And uh, they got a, um, a very easy house in the countryside, but, you know, in that period, it was everything very hippie and very easy. Mm-hmm. And that was another very good idea right? because we were moving there in summer and, you know, Europeans, we do quite long holidays. <laughs> and oh. then after school, we were moving there and then everything was changing completely. Then Mediterranean, no rules. The, this island went to move from one place to another place. It was something very really different, really very good. A lot of macrame and... Uh... <laughs> yes, end of the 70s, that would be macrame. Si, si. Can I ask you a question? When you say they took an easy house, what do you mean by easy? Today, when you say Ibiza and a house, you think that, you know, it was what a privilege. And in that period was not, nobody wanted to go in Spain to Ibiza. They, they were not the Spanish people. And it was a place, there were quite no, not a lot of policemen, very easy, with a lot of Ibis, uh, low profile, you know. My parents, they were about 40 years old. And then they, they said, we need to go somewhere which is different because they got in love with that, to, to understand things different. My auntie went with her family. She got another house there. Then we were 20, 30 person of family together in a garden doing a family oh, that sounds amazing <laughs> super nice I say thanks to them Michael. yeah we're still doing it we're still doing uh, it oh amazing how wonderful to carry that on through the generations so it sounds like your family was very strong and opinionated but also very open to new perspectives and actively seeking out changes of scenery in order to to keep their minds and opinions evolving. Well, I, I think in that period, a lot of people were like this. <laughs> it was a fantastic generation, people moving in that period. And so you're an adolescent in this period. It sounds very formative. Most teenagers go through some growing pains and have some angst or awkwardness and sometimes getting ourselves into situations where we feel like we need to rebel or where we need to really, really try on a new identity. I'm just wondering how you sort of worked through that stage in order to become an adult. Can happen when you are adolescent, can happen when you are a bit elder than adolescent, but tendentially a kind of temperament, which is in some way creative, many times has a kind of fight in relation with what is um, the, the the certainty of, of his own uh, uh, comfort zone, no? which mm. is the family. And mm-hmm. it was not easy with mine, my parents, because they were really open to, to evolutive things. And, and I was saying when I was tipo, 13, perhaps I would like to do architecture. Mm-hmm. And my father said, oh, that's fantastic. I, in, when I was young, I was not so good at painting and drawing and was so academic architecture in his time. And he was saying it, it was ridiculous because I think it was not about creativity. It was only about academic 
Ah. Yes, I'm very happy you, you, you can get into a work which is going to be creative, with a, but at the same time, has a, you are going to relate to space. The problem for me was not so much to get a um, big discovery. Then I was the one in the middle that they never knew what I was doing, you know. That it was very easy to disappear and to do things because they were not focused in the middle one. What I, I needed when I went to Madrid to study architecture, after two or three years being there, I was always a good student. That was something that for me was natural. Okay. I was always reading and studying. And then they didn't look at me a lot because, you know, she's a good student and nobody looks at you when you're an adolescent. This is a right. very good thing. You want to have freedom? <laughs> good student. Then they, nobody knows anything about all the horrendous things you can do. That is the good, the good news, no? Okay, so you were stealthily mm. taking advantage of your freedom and hiding in plain sight because you got good grades and you were the middle child. Beautiful. Makes perfect sense. Say that. Okay. But when I was in Madrid, what I, I never could explain very well why I needed to move from Madrid to, to Italy. I, I needed to, to get new experiences to change. At the end, moving from one country to the other one and getting out of my comfort zone, that is the argument. I think in some way, or because you discuss in family, or because you, there's something you need to create at a distance with what they gave to you, you know, what are mm. your roots, even if they are fantastic or, or they are mm-hmm. dramatic. I think many creative people, we, we create a distance because you need to find your roots, your personal roots. Mm-hmm. So then you, you need something that is very personal. I don't know, has to do with identity. And, and perhaps you, you, then you take 20 years to do it <laughs> all your right. life. Right. <laughs> But you, you need that distance because you, you know, good things never come always from, from so comfort uh, zones, no? I could then... Right. So it sounds like you felt a combination of needing to sort of separate yourself from your comfort zone so that you could stand on your own two feet and really sort of investigate what it is that is meaningful to you separately from everything that you were offered. And I'm just wondering at that point in time, you're looking at it with hindsight now. So you understand maybe where it came from. But at that point of time, what did it feel like to you? Like you just needed to get to someplace different? When you're young, you have nothing. You have Mm -hmm. nothing in your hand. That is fantastic. First thing. It's not so bad news, I think. But, and and you have a really white canvas always in your hand. And many times you, I remember perfectly thinking, that's never going to be a real place to do something, you know, so you, nobody can tell you really how it's going to be your path. No, that, right, there's no right. idea that you are going to have it even. Because then, But all this uncertainty is interesting. It's an interesting place to be. And I've, I've heard from a lot of people that naivete is actually a really beautiful, it's that white canvas that you're talking about. You don't know what you don't know, so you can't get in your own way. <laughs> but you move, you move. You know that, for example, then for me, uh, when I grow up, I, I said, Arquitectura is not in that city. And then when I was in Madrid, it was not enough. I needed to move and to, to put myself in another situation. And all these things, always they help because uh, Arquitectura was always the same. But the way I was approaching architecture in Madrid and with the other students, we were already in the 80s, no? it was all about, obviously, postmodernism. And uh, it was very interesting because it was very strong. It came in the 80s, it's very strong. And uh, when I moved to, to Milano, uh, possibly this idea of postmodernism and architecture was interesting, but there was a Memphis movement, you know, the from Sotsas. Yes, yes. There were other kinds of things more related to tools for living in another way. There were the last uh, interesting revolutions, very um, movements that I, I think they, for me, were very interesting. And the last, uh, at the same time, rationalist. Uh, they were already teachers. So they, they were architects as, as education but they were working as as designers too. They they were mm-hmm. well, they were writers. They were many things, and there was a kind of um, magic rationalism. That these two words they should not fit, but they fit perfectly. And that was this Italian way of approaching the project. No, that for me is been uh, really interesting through personages like uh, Castiglioni, uh, the brothers Castiglioni, that they had the luck 
to do an exhibition, then much later in, in the Triennale of Milano to do it in, in honor of Achille, one of, of them. Mm-hmm. At the same time, celebrate the, the work of, of the different, of the brothers. No, personage like Schultz, as we were saying, and that is a personage incredible, I think, that is. The way he, he make us think about, you know, the project that, you know, always saying, you know, for me, the real design, if I have to define is something that begins when the, the landscape, the space for all the logical thoughts and, and thinking ends and begin the space for the magic. You no, know? then I like a lot this idea that always, you know, putting the, the concept of design in a space, which is making you move through other energies, no? And uh, I like it a lot. And, uh, this, uh, and there were coming many oh, personages. There was one teacher that me, I like it a lot. And it was um, Maldonado, mm. Tomas Maldonado. He was coming from Argentina. He was artist and doing a, a very interesting um, contemporary um, art approach with his brothers because it was a kind of family, very interesting in that way. Then he went to Europe, went to Ulm, that in, you can imagine that is a school, you know, after the, the heritage of Bauhaus. Ulm is the, the school that really created the concept of module of recreating all the, the more severe and logical and, and intelligent and, and valid pieces of design for the reconstruction of a Germany after all mm. what happened in, in, in all Europe. No? And mm-hmm. after doing that, he came to Milano and he came to Firenze and then to Milano. To, and he was, for me, this, to get into a land of, of rationalists that were, they have this other, at the same time, they have this kind of space for magic. It was so strange because I was coming from Ulma. Then I thought, really, there was not a space for that. And then they demonstrated me that was, uh, we were speaking a few times about this and it was very nice conversation. And, and it's something that I, I think was very beautiful to, to, this was, Maldonado was a man really interested already in, in progettazione ambientale. That means environmental, design already when it was before the the beginning of this uh, millennium and and he was already um, making us speak and think a lot about the idea of systemic thinking and systemic approach systemic systemic all the cause of system the, the idea of complexity to move comfortable in the density in what can be complex, no? Mm -hmm. And then uh, put in architecture, design, and all the new attitudes in this. He was fantastic on that. And then, uh, you know, the first uh, new ecological thoughts in my mind came thanks to Maldonado. That sounds like a really, really fertile time. I I can hear the way you speak about it, that it really lit you up. See, you you don't know very well what to do with all these things when you are young. Eh? They are there, <laughs> you know, and, and then the time you know, helps you to work on them, no? But did you also feel like you were part of a kind of movement that was growing? Did you feel like you were part of something? What I think helped uh, me to be comfortable there, I was coming from Spain. as I was the generation. I was part of a generation of uh, when uh, Franco died and when I was uh, young, then it was very important that we were changing rules completely. We, they were saying, you've got to change a lot of things. And when I arrived to Milano, I think I was not feeling like a, a daughter. And then, you know, when you are a daughter, you are very respectful. I was feeling like, you know, we have to break rules and uh, look at them in a very easy way. No, don't, don't be, um, okay. Don't be too much respectful, which is never perfect. I call, you know, mm-hmm. I always say masters must get into you. You have to interiorize them, but mm-hmm. you have to understand what is for you very you know, important for someone else. What can be a master for me can be. Uh, thought in many ways, but then you cannot go out with an output that is uh, too much relative to their work. Right. You must come out with your own output, which is nothing to do with all the, the incredible energy that you absorb from a master, no? Yes. Then uh, that perhaps is part in, in my in my generation in Spain was very clear because really we had to change many things. I don't know. This for me is normal. I hope that for many people too. 
No, so we, we, we ended now a book in, in Cassina, for example, a company which I'm doing a kind of art direction now from eight years. And mm -hmm. it's, it's a company that has, from the beginning of my work, always a, the company is going to be a centenary now. But at the same time, it's a company that we had to do this year, an anniversary, uh, a 50 anniversary, and about a um, decision that the company took a certain moment. It's a, it was a company already working with the incredible creative people from the 50s. But they decided to, in, especially in the 70s to, to the 73, just because now is the, the 50th anniversary, uh, mm -hmm. to create a kind of division that was called e Maestri, the masters, because the company began to work with uh, the foundations of Le Corbusier, uh, Charlotte Perrion and Jeanne Ré. Mm -hmm. They asked to, to produce, no, reproduce part of the element de rangement, no, the, the, uh, you can call them in many ways. That was the, the way they were calling them. Those, a collection of different pieces from their fundamental, uh, fundamentals for, for thinking the, what is the, the products to arrange uh, an ambience, no? And uh, they began to do it in the sixties, but in the seventies, they said, that is so interesting that perhaps you have to go to other foundations, the people that they've been uh, really important at the beginning of rationalism and they gave the value as Ritwell, uh, you have to know, they went even to Macintosh or they went to Asplund, uh, different uh, artists that they, they, they asking to the, to the foundations, can we uh, reproduce and, and get into a production what is being important in that master, no? Uh, these things came like a, um, um, an organized uh, uh, part of the company and the production, which was always living with what the other contemporary designers were working in the company. And all this, at the end, has been very interesting because we are celebrating now with a book, a very nice exhibition we did in Salone, no? And in reality, it was so interesting to be there with 15 foundations of the different masters, but because now we see the things from another point of view, a lot of people that were working in the company that perhaps they passed away, as for example, Vico Magistretti, they became masters, just to explain you, or Gio Ponti or, mm -hmm. or other mm -hmm. fantastic ones. And um, to look at that, understand how the, in that period of the 70th speed that was beginning of uh, 72, there was the learning from Las Vegas, just to understand as the book, no, like, mm -hmm. uh, from Venturi. And was the beginning of all this uh, postmodern moment of ferment. And uh, there was the idea of, you know, the museum is not anymore the museum, the museum, the city is broken. Then, and, and then, the, you know, the, the domestic landscape can be even our museum. And then those pieces came into our domestic landscape as part of uh, um, the values of the, the all the last uh, research in architecture. You know, all these things get blended in that period, especially. And it's very interesting that today those things for us are quite obvious, but I think Cassina is a company that really did a, a big effort in, in that way. And is, is, I'm very honored to, to be uh, working with them. And then we come back to the word masters, as we were saying. Masters is something that people that they had a lot to say in a certain moment and they did a lot to change, a lot to do in a brave way. And those pieces they got through through time, um, filtering the values in a fantastic way. And uh, and many times they came into our domestic landscape. And it's very interesting that to defend a company that is still doing all this with a, a lot of attention, obviously is not the only <laughs> argument about design that we... Uh, the domain of design today has a crossover much larger than furniture and the uh, uh, representation of, of the first uh, pioneers. But they are pioneers, and it's very interesting that uh, part of my work is to take care of, of this with a nice team, you know. It is very interesting because it's a sort of stewardship of history and context and the mindset from which things grew and culture was informed. So that's your your art direction with Casino, which you've been doing since 2015. But I do want to set the stage for your very early career. From your studies in Milano to your early career, how did you get your professional footing? First, it's, it's fantastic because you never think at the beginning of your career that you could ever, ever have your own studio. 
It's the first thing that is fantastic. How, how we, we get into this work because you like it and because you think I'm going to work. I want to work with someone, which is good because as I'm never going to have my own studio because what that was for me, I, I thought was quite impossible. Then I went to work with the Padova. Mm-hmm. The Padova was a company. They were editing uh, design because already in the faculty of architecture in Milano, there was a lot of design in, inside my education. Then design and architecture, there were two levels of project that could live together. And for me, I was comfortable in that dimension. Then in the part of, I knew that Vico Magistretti was working there because he was uh, the companion of the woman, Madalena de Padova, the owner of the company. Mm. Then uh, I, I said, if I go there, perhaps I can work with him. I could, then he was part of my... <laughs> and then this happened, happened. i I been there about six years, something like this. And I had the luck to work many afternoon uh, because he was in a certain age, um, this... Uh, designer and architect Vico Magistretti. He was in a moment of his life that he was calm. He was teacher in uh, in London. Echo, he was teacher in Royal School of Arts and, and he was coming back. Uh, but in the day, normally in the afternoon, he was coming to us and I was the uh, technical office. Then there were not a lot of people. Then really there was a very direct relation. He was always saying well, that today, for me, I'm a, like a good doctor. Sometimes I go to a convention out of my city. Sometimes I, I go to teachers, sometimes to, to London, which is a honor. But then my life is, has a kind of routine, no? But you are n- g- not going to work anymore in that kind of routine. He knew already the complexity that was coming, no? And I mm. liked that because he was saying, don't be afraid. You've got sign. Go on. He was always so nice saying... For me, it's been very, very important. Him, him as Madalena de Padova. And um, they made me do the first uh, piece of design, sign that piece of design, and things like this, uh, and co-signing. At the same time, I opened a little studio with two of my friends. Uh, they were students with me in architecture, and we did a little studio. It was super nice, but was not working. It was, uh, I understood that the, 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 we, I needed to, to go back. Mm. And to do something more. Then I, I began to work with uh, Piero Lissoni, that was uh, an architect, which is uh, like a big brother because he's um, more of my re- generation, just a bit elder than me. And uh, he had um, already a studio that was running, working very well. And he was working with Capellini, with companies that I thought in that period were fantastic. I worked with him five years. Then I, I closed my studio. I, oh, I worked for, for another studio. Then I went back and then that was very important for me because that gave me another and larger vision, another time. And then arrived already the, the, the 2000. And then I said, OK, open my own studio. From that moment, I began to work by my own. Uh, and things were much easier than what I thought. <laughs> ah, well, that's good news. Why were they much easier than you thought they would be? Because when you're young, I think you... Many things are very easy because I, I think it's important to approach what's in your hand to leave. I was comfortable, but as having a, the responsibility of studio and have my voice and, and to, 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 to can live from that, I, that was mm-hmm. compli- I, I thought it would be more difficult. And this, when I began, I think I had already a path, things were working, people were curious, uh, then uh, was everything was fluent. You know? you know, they are different moments in your life that you find a wave that moves you uh, in a fluent way and can be in different, it's not only in a professional way. Yeah? I'm speaking in many ways. Yeah. And, you know, in relation with, uh, I have two daughters you know, from two with 10 years of distance in between them. Uh, I've got to have to find many times the way to get into their path, you know, and that but I was more mature than for me was uh, was an exercise more comfortable to approach. But I think there are moments when you you say that, that I want that, I want to say I don't know how, but then oh, you you get onto that and things are fluent. It's not always fluent; no, it doesn't have to be. You know, now we are in a moment we are looking. You know, I, I was listening uh, the conversation in between. Uh, Harari and uh, Mustafa Kusir Suleiman from The Economist, uh, you know, Mustafa, the, the man who wrote now The Coming Wave uh, about AI and, mm-hmm. and um, Harari, you know, the philosopher from Homo Deus and a serious conversation about AI. Mm-hmm. If, if AI uh, can agency, 
even if it can have the, as Suleiman was saying, a kind of empathic way of agency, mm -hmm. it's a serious argument, uh, Capito. Then we are getting into, into another conversation. It was a very interesting conversation. I was, uh, I just sent it to my daughters immediately, uh, Capito, to, to say, let's get, uh, informed about uh, what is in this moment this serious uh, agent of uncertainty that we have in our hands. It's, yes. It's going to be very good. It's going to be complex. We are going to, uh, the human side is going to be in a side because that's going to come a, a kind of more intelligent agency of uh, problems that at the end, how can you, we manage many of those things? No, it's not only about, am I creative? They are going to take me in my energy. It's not about, it's not so little arguments. It's a, it's a serious and larger argument. So it, it sounds like you're avidly, voraciously curious and consuming information and really grappling with the complexity of AI and the coming implications and sharing it with your daughters, which I love. Mm -hmm. But I've got a daughter, which is 18 years old, and she's beginning in London. In the university to do architecture. Oh. And uh, I was saying to her, then we, we went to, to see the exhibition of uh, Marina Abramovic. That was an mm. incredible, finally serious exhibition about the whole work. Uh, and he's a person that I had the, the luck to know and, uh, and share with her, with, with Sofia. It was very interesting to, to get into that. At the same time, getting a book for that and then uh, and saying, now you are going to get into this faculty uh, speaking about architecture in the middle of this wave, uh, what is happening. Like, then it's very important that we cross over a lot of information. Yes, surely. Yes, absolutely. And what a beautiful picture you just painted of a very intersectional experience in terms of being with your daughter. There's a generational component to that. There's a art, architecture, tech, AI, human evolution kind of thing going on. Marina is the first woman uh, doing an exhibition in that museum that is at the end of the Royal Academy you know, of Arts is, is the, finally is done and is first woman. And but she's all about many virtual and, you know, spiritual and, and different ways to, to research our possibility of, of communicating with others or the antennas of art, you know. And then I think it's very interesting because in this moment, I think her energy, her human uh, energy is very interesting. And it's very nice to connect these things, you know. Yes, I love that you explain it as the antennas of art. You know, that makes me want to ask you about the virtual and the spiritual and the AI. What's your relationship to all of that? Well, like, oh, AI, we, I don't know how to put so well in the middle of that. <laughs> yeah. We will see, you know, because it's, it's more about intelligence that is getting more intelligent than us. Then, it's, you know, perhaps it's not about, you know, the magic or what you were saying, which is the more spiritual as. Well, no, I think uh, I think we are in a civilization of, of which is very relative to image, not to the perfect image. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, in moments like these, where you know, even if we have a, a, a photo, an image of us that gets into the net uh, in that virtual, as you are saying to me, in that virtual part of our life, even you know, we modify that to make it even more perfect. No, this, mm -hmm. this society, society of image, which is, I, I think. In some way, uh, I think in this moment is a moment to understand what is in the back of that. People which are interested in, in thinking in the other side of what is this first uh, visual uh, layer of, uh, mm. of image. And there are many ways, many different artists or philosophers or thinkers or many ways. I think uh, uh, we were friends with a person that I've been including a lot in, in the work we were doing with Casino, with uh, different things, uh, uh, which is uh, Manuele Koch, and he's a young philosopher, Italian young philosopher, teacher in, in the Corps de Haute Etude à Paris, uh, in Paris, and he teaches a little bit in Harvard the, the last year. And then he, he's a man very open and um, to, 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 to interconnect many, many arguments. He did a book about the philosophy of, of home. And, and mm. we, we have a lot of nice conversation about, you know, today, even as designers and architects, we, the way we control the, the space, uh, uh, is uh, is through the the meter the, the, how we can measure is been always through the centimeters the meters the inches when we can it's not important the system but it's not anymore um, enough for the virtual part then 
uh, if we are speaking about tools that are enlarging our powers of our hand for, for drinking, you know, a glass of water is the, the prothesis of our little hand, the seat is, you know, like a third leg to be the, having a rapport, you know, and, and like this, you can go on. All the physical prothesis and it's part of my work every day, even the space and everything. But uh, the prothesis of our mind, uh, as he, and he was doing very nice uh, tests about this, like, uh, the, the prothesis about our mind, they are very different, you know, as the, as the smartphone. I could, you know, uh, those are prothesis of the, the from, um, for, for our head. The, they are very different. We cannot work with with uh, measurements, uh, the normal measurements of an architect. And all this space, uh, which is virtual, uh, we is, today we leave the, the virtual and the physical together. But if I'm an architect, I have to work in both. Mm-hmm. This is absolutely necessary. Then I I don't have the same ways of measure. Then it's very interesting. Yeah. Then I think we have to enlarge the the, the instruments to to create like, a project. And uh, there is a lot of space. There are corridors of, of uh, communication. I remember, for example, where that uh, during the, the pandemics, no, and I was in home, like everyone, I could trying to how to enhance my work to work, for example, with Hayward, which is a company that we are working for ten years. And uh, I, at the beginning, when they asked me to not only do product but to do a work that was a bit more enlarged to to interact with the space, to interact with the teams, different teams of work, to work in, in an enlarged way, uh, to work as architect. We did an hotel Hayward. We, uh, we did it in that period even without me going there. But what I, at the beginning of our relation, I put a lot of energy uh, saying to them, I'm not going to be all the time with you. Uh, because it's in Michigan, it's not so easy. Then let me come a few times, but it's impossible that I'm all the time there. Then let the teams, different, the team of architecture, the team of design, the team of engineers to come to Milano too. Then like this, I don't ask they come a lot, but they come sufficient that we create a kind of interactive human relation that then we are connected physically, mm-hmm. m- mentally, you know. And then even if we get into a virtual way, we know each other and then you've been in my table, you've been in my chair and I've been in yours. Yeah. And then we were a team and we had all this experience. Then we were very comfortable. They needed to do a hotel in the city and we didn't even not come in there because we knew the team. We were so confident. I was very proud of that. And in that time, one of the other things I couldn't do and I didn't know how can I, uh, Maxi, which is a museum from Rome, in Italy, mm-hmm. a good friend, a person that I know, Domitilla Dardi, they, she asked me, why don't you be part of a little project, Casamondo, was a project done with uh, the Forma Fantasma, which is a, a very interesting duo of design, um, Italian, that I like a lot, that they were giving the principles of the, of the project. And each um, of us, designer, had to create, like for one week, three images a day, uh, in the in the Instagram, um, creating our avatar, uh, which was uh, me. My con- the argument for me was, uh, you know, working at home. Right? Then mm-hmm. I had to 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 create for one week. It uh, was my time. I began to work with uh, in a virtual way, doing this kind of very playful uh, vignette. Uh, or you know, so my and a lovely little history about this this avatar. Finally, was me with my wings. Uh, uh, finally, it was me uh, with my dog that was uh, um, doing with me a lot of things from yoga and uh, at the same time we were sharing the computer because we said, I don't want, I want to be with my plants. Then he was <laughs> working in the connecting wheel. We were doing a lot of. Um, in, in my in my virtual world, I had a lot of space and a certain freedom that I don't have in my real world. And mm-hmm. it was fun. It was nice. And I, I liked the, this occasion because at the end, the project had a, a lot of sense for me. Then it made me think, oh, if I think um, from this point of view, it's so different uh, because I have the metrics are others. Then I, I have other, uh, other space of freedom for doing it. Other limits, but other space of limits. Then it's, uh, but it's been very interesting. 
Then I, I said to you two examples. Now, in a period where I couldn't do anything more than, you know, taking care of your plants in home if you have them or, or um, 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 your family or mm-hmm. making the bread, you know, uh, as many people did, I, 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 we share things in different um, virtual ways. If we were doing a, a map of each person, each one who could do in a virtual way, really, how was his own experience? Mm. It's very interesting. And we did, for example, uh, out of the box, a kind of conversation with the person that for me were very interesting and I could give them the relation with them to others because I couldn't give to Casina all those things. Then I was giving only the only thing I had, the relation as, for example, uh, Ola Foreliason. I got the, the luck to have this fantastic little relation to uh, to share with others. And we did. Then uh, in other occasions, I would never think to, to share that or to, to give to that the value, you know. Right. Then corridors of, of the virtual, uh, the spiritual side, I think, is, is something that perhaps is not today. It's not the conversation. I think I think I was saying to you, it has to do with the, the, the liturgic side of life, the, the magic side, or anything which is the wrong side, which is in the back of the perfection, which means the human side. Yeah. There is a lot, and the virtual uh, corridors of uh, communication, they are, there's a lot to work on them, a lot, a lot, as designers, as architects do. So when you described meeting the teams with Hayworth and being in each other's spaces, what I always am very impressed with is this idea that when you're in somebody else's space, you're receiving so much information, so much communication from them that is nonverbal, that is simply about the energy in the space, the objects they have, the way they live that you pick up from looking around them. Yes that helps you know a person without having to go through the process of actually asking the questions and listening to the answers. And then when you leave, you take that with you in a quantum spiritual sort of way. You've been in their intersubjective field and you have a sense of them that you can carry with you. And you described that so well, but also how that is what made your virtual collaboration so successful is because you had that already. I, I choose in my life, or my, my work is about no verbal language. Then I, yes. And this is something that when I was adolescent already, I had very clear in my mind. I decided to do architecture because of that, because I said, in some way, it would be something creative. That means you gonna create a kind of vocabulary or a kind of language. You're gonna speak something through a space that was to study architecture, no? For me. Mm-hmm. Then, and it's still been for me very important to stay connected to think about materia or uh, regenerated materia, which is one of the most fascinated, uh, well, and uh, biomateria, then another argument, which is even the one which is, I hope is coming into the real system of tools like in, 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 in these five years that AI is going to change everything, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I yeah. hope that other things are coming too, because even if they are not going to be any more important and we are going to become all of us just little gardeners, but I would like to have the, the, the tools to, to, to get into better co- conversation even with my plants, no? And to, yeah. to, to, to understand how to have many m- new um, tools, I got to understand uh, many things from, from all the other species. No, I mean, I think. Uh, well, there's a psychedelic revolution happening too. <laughs> so. it's, a, it's, a, it's another thing that, you know, but, but that is, that is, is not a friend in me. I think to enlarge the, the, the human window, no, to a, mm-hmm. a larger window when you don't have in front of you the, the gestalt uh, relation, you know, nature and you, but you are part of that nature, or, or even there are many ways to, to affront, there are a lot of philosophical ways to, to, to think about this, but, you know, you are part of it, no? this uh, mm-hmm. evolving circumstance that you are part of it with all the good and bad, um, I think it's, it's interesting that it's, it's becoming always more clear, no? Yes. And as it becomes more clear, it also becomes more complex. See, 
I was listening the other day, this person that we're speaking about, and, you know, listening to the language of whales because they, uh-huh. marine biologists, use this technology to make contact with them just to understand the many things that are going to be very helpful for, for the new kind of languages. Our masters, I call, um, they uh, larger them from the mm-hmm. humanistic ones, you know. I think perhaps in, in the Oriental philosophies many times, you know, they were really, I think, more more open to understand that masters were coming from small, immense, and, in, mm. and not only coming from many steep things. Perhaps we have to learn a lot. Or we have to rewind a lot, no? But um, it's how much in this moment with the companies we are trying to look and say, Alora, are we, uh, rethink- we are rethinking the, the, the processes the way we do. What about the whole company rethinking how to, to, to really understand Atelier in another way or the way we, we get into the technologies that for years they were um, just renovated but growing. Now we are not so much interested in renovating and growing. Perhaps we, we are doing an, the same product with a technology which is less important but, or less new, but perhaps we think it's renewing other things. So we are really looking to, to the way to we produce in, in different perspectives and crossing many of them. And I think that is very interesting, Michael. I think the parameters to define what is good and what is not change so fast uh, that um, we, we have a kind of period that there is not, uh, I said, formula. And it's very interesting what is, what is happening in this moment from that point of view. As you're describing this period that we're in where we have to rethink everything and the parameters are changing, do you feel, do you recognize yourself as a pioneer of a new era? I think, uh, I think, <laughs> I think if I say no, because I, I, I feel I am a generation which has been in the middle of passage. Then you, are, all of us, we are in, when you say you define yourself as a designer, we are in a moment when we say we are all designers. We even, mm-hmm. we understand that plants, you know, they been the first modifying, I call them, they, they were the first designers, I call them, and then the strong designers. And what I say, Pioneers, perhaps I am part of a generation which is in the middle of, of two ways of thinking. Possibly, and I come from a generation that they, they was so materialist in some way, but is stupidly materialist that uh, finally today, perhaps we become really materialist because we understand and we focus on material to understand. Like, <laughs> you, <laughs> finally, we use the word in a way that perhaps has a, a possibility that also to make me think in a positive way, you know, uh, get really materialist, get us really concerned. And so I, I think, uh, the, I hope the, the young generations w- which are in front of me, they are the ones they are really have in front of them a so strong. If I, I, I feel like a, a generation of passage, me more. You know what I mean? Yeah, you've described that in so many ways. This temporality, these corridors of communication, the passages of your life, and also in we are pioneer in this, and this is possibly because yeah. we need to approach this in a different way. Yes, we are enlarging the the measurements of what means the space. Then they said to you, you know, speak about uh, with any interiorist or architect, say, you know, what is, uh, say to me, which are the new things that you cannot speak about, you know, uh, we, we are thinking about lighting and colors and this is, is all ridiculous. And in, in this moment is how much we can give to people a way to live in, in a domestic land space, space or in, in a proper spaces that they can feel uh, a certain well-being and nothing, but it's not only about that. Like in this moment, it's, uh, we are considering things which are a bit larger than this, you know. All the uncertainty yeah. in all these arguments that we were saying before, they are in, in the, our head, you know, and, and the, the land under our feet is a little bit moving too. Then, yeah. Pionies in the way that we, we know that now is like this, you know. And, and, and anything, anything we are touching in a project, even if it's a little project, is, is connected to a, a larger um, object you now, which is uh, what is material working, that is material which is a natural one, like a marble, or is a, a regenerated plastic. And you are connected to a, a, an hyper object, which is uh, something that you can't control, or you have to deal in another way. Then layers of, uh, of relation with uh, mm-hmm. what is for us the word, in many ways at the same time. 
Like you, anything you are doing, you are, you know, you're thinking about something you are producing. Uh, you have to think from the beginning of the way it's going to die, how it's going to be dismantled. But, but it's, that, I think, in some way, in the way we were working, in my experience in Italy, searching always a kind of quality of uh, techniques, always, there was always this idea of understanding the, the, what about the time and the piece we are doing? What, what, what about the quality of the materials? It's interesting that get old and what means that get old? We always were, can get old because people are still giving it value. It's not because the material is resistant or resilient. It's, it's because the, the energy which is in the project is resilient and then People want to keep your, your daughter or someone else want to, to have it or want to recycle. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, what it is, it's, it's not only a question of resistant materia. It's, it's a question of how many values are into a project that they, they, they can be, you can keep interesting and filtered in a good way in the time that can be revaluable and, and, and reused. Like a bit of them. It's, it's, a, it's a complex argument, which is fascinating. Yes. Today we have the double layer of, of physical and then all these new prothesis for our mind, which are, yeah, we need to work a lot on them too. And then to understand how to fulfill this virtual work in, in a lighter and, and different uh, way. Yes, it's a new frontier. And I guess that's one of the reasons I see you as a pioneer, because you're thinking about this and you're, you're, you're thinking about what the shape, the materiality, the value, the limits, the freedom, the interactivity, the energy of this virtual space is. And I really appreciate that about you. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I, I will like to reborn a capital and to begin today. <laughs> <You know. laughs> really, really, I'm not joking. I think it's uh, really... Uh, oh, Things are changing so much that I uh, I used too much time all of my life. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you're timeless. Yes, you're well, timeless. No, well, no, well, Your no. energy is T- timeless. Even it's not even even. Uh, it's, it's, I think for timeless, Martha, can be so dangerous. Argument. I think you always have to be always the daughter of the time you're living now. Then then like this, you yes. evolve, and then you keep. I think you keep your adolescent side into your 80 years body. You know what I mean? I see my mother, which is uh, 88, is going to be now, and she's still having a strong, the little philosopher inside. She sees, I like her. (laughs) She did a few moments of big change in her life. She's still been very curious uh, even about me or about my nieces. And she compares and she gets into the the mood. I go, she's good. She's good. Nice. What a great model. And I love that you challenged the word timeless. (laughs) I think it's important and that, you know. It's a I'm- killer. It's a killer, that word. Like, uh, yes, I think it's better you represent what, what is your interest in this moment. I, we are never the same. Yeah. And then uh, I hope um, I had different moments of, and different Patricias in all my life. And I yeah. keep on creating a new one and a new one and a new one and a new one and for the time I have. For the time <laughs> I have, like, which is just time. It's just my time, which is always a short time like, for all of us. In relation with many things, no. But I, we are enjoying speaking. I forgot I'm speaking, and someone can listen. <laughs> <laughs> that is good. I don't know if it's if it's bad too, but it's no. good because it makes me not think about that. Like, which is, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. Thank you for sharing so generously of yourself. Before we wrap up, is there anything else that you? would like to broadcast about yourself that you feel is important to share as a daughter of the time that you're living in? I think this idea of complexity is very important. Uh, to enlarge those kind of parameters for me is, is, is important. Another thing that I, I for me is beauty is always, I was sending to one of my daughters to the you know, this little instrument that you, you can connect and you can use as a music player, um, some um, wooden tools and even a plant, uh, and you can play a very uh-huh. simple, you know, um, like a little instrument. And uh-huh. I'm always more and more curious on how can we get more ways to install conversations which are not just our conversations, no different kind of creative conversations with the media, with, with what we, if we are part of this nature and an artifice all together, mm-hmm. um, more conversations, conversation, conversation, I think uh, 
possibly it's the democratic way of thinking that we we have as human and the dialogue and conversation is, uh, is I think it's the only weapon we can have. You know, different conversation, find new languages for conversation. Not only yes. this. All these things are super important for me. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could evolve so that we could hear frequencies that we can't currently hear? Or at least we could design translators that could communicate sí. with our dogs and our plants, that could translate frequencies of other energies that we don't currently understand so that we can emit Instead of converse, <laughs> they are fantastic people doing it already. Eh? I think yeah. I then, those are the, the pioneers. You know, when you say to me the word pioneer, I would like to, to say to you, no, 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 no. I want to be, you know, this uh, upgraded pioneer that which is six now <laughs> that they are doing this. I would, that would be fantastic to go to see uh, Donna Haraway. In Santa Cruz, that she's like, for me, like a Nel Dorado, like a bit this, this <laughs> incredible biologist and uh, feminist and, uh, and uh, philosopher. I think in art, she gave a lot of energies. And to go there one day, I will love to write and say, just hello. Like a bit of, <laughs> I even look at, you know, I love to look sometimes in Google Map. Um, uh, the time from one place I like to another place I would like to be. And more or less, mm -hmm. about, I think, 10 hours, I think, I will arrive to the hotel where uh, Judy Chicago lives in uh, the Belen Hotel. Uh -huh. I went to Brooklyn to see her, one of the, the work she did, there was this triangular table with all the voice for the woman that never had the voice and blah, blah, and fantastic. Uh, see, see the uh -huh. light and I have the book too and I like it. Today to do another one, there will be with more enlarged because it's not anymore a, a problem about women, it's not about many others, you know, the, the, the dinner party, to create a kind of dinner party. In, in my fantasy, I go to that one woman, to the other one by car, as I did in America many times. Uh -huh. Then in this case, I will do this, I go uh, from, from um, California to New Mexico, no, Capito? Yeah. Uh, go to, to see trip. two fantastic women. From past, but for me, they have to do a lot with future. My fantastical echo, this, this is my, my dream, my lovely dream. <laughs> I love this dream. I love this dream. I, if I could be a fly in your road trip, but don't eat me. <laughs> <laughs> Patricia, mm. this has been so enjoyable. Thank you so much. <laughs> Ciao. Hey, thanks so much for listening. For a transcript of this episode and more about Patricia, including images of her work, head to cleverpodcast.com. If you like Clever, there are a number of ways you can support us. Share Clever with your friends, leave us a five-star rating or a kind review, support our sponsors, or hit the follow or subscribe button in your podcast app so that our new episodes will turn up in your feed. We love to hear from you on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. I mean, X. You can find us at Clever Podcast, and you can find me at Amy Devers. Stay tuned for upcoming announcements and bonus content. You can subscribe to our newsletter at cleverpodcast.com to make sure you don't miss a thing. Clever is hosted and produced by me, Amy Devers, with editing by Mark Zurowinski, production assistance from Alana Nevins and Anushka Stefan, and music by L1011. Clever is a proud member of the Surround Podcast Network. Visit surroundpodcasts.com to discover more of the architecture and design industry's premier shows. And we are going to become all of us just little gardeners.